Please take your Bible this evening for our scripture reading to Psalm 26, please, the 26th Psalm. Twelve verses here, we're going to read the entire psalm, read the verses responsibly. We'll begin together on verse one, then I'll read two, we'll alternate reading until we end on verse number 12 of Psalm 26. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture tonight, all of us standing please to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse one of Psalm 26, ready? Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers, and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash mine hands in innocency. So will I compass thine altar, O Lord, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men in whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity, redeem me, and be merciful unto me. Let's finish with reading 12 together also. My foot standeth in an even place, in the congregations will I bless the Lord. Let's bow for prayer together, shall we? Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer tonight. Lord, we thank you for the Bible this evening, and thank you, Lord, that holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And Lord, that you have not only inspired your word, but you have preserved your word for us, and we have copies in our hand tonight. And Lord, we're grateful. I pray that each of us would listen carefully to the special as it's brought tonight, and that we would ask you to minister to our heart and to prepare our heart, that it would be good soil, that the word of God would fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives. Lord, use the special to that end, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have labored in the vineyard of the Lord, and in seems the world has stolen our reward but god has not forgotten and when he calls us home we'll receive eternal treasure and a place of honor near the throne it's not in vain it's not in vain we serve a risen savior jesus rules and reigns the heavens cheer us on we do not walk alone our labor our witness our faith has seen our faithful service through the years all the heartaches all the burdens all the tears but do not be discouraged there's a purpose there's a plan there's a reason for each trial so trust the leading of his hand it's not in vain it's not in vain we serve a risen savior jesus rules and reigns the heavens cheer us on we do not walk alone our labor our witness our faith it's not in vain 
Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word. We're thankful, Lord, that our faith is not in vain. Lord, thank you that we serve a risen Savior and he's in the world today. We're thankful, Lord, that you're real. And I pray you'd show yourself very real to each of us here tonight. Lord, as we open up your word, may your spirit minister to us and may he be the teacher tonight as we take the word that you gave to men of old and I pray, Lord, that you would apply this word to our heart tonight and we would understand what it means to wholly follow you and to truly be a wholehearted Christian. So open our eyes as we look into your word this evening. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Most of you know the Psalms were the hymn book of Israel and uh, they would sing these Psalms that we read and uh, there's usually a story or at least a way uh, behind, a story behind every psalm or a way they use the psalms. And the Jews used this particular psalm, 26, before offering a sacrifice or be on their way to the temple to offer their sacrifice, they would sing this particular psalm. And David is telling here uh, about really a man or woman who would be wholehearted before God. David was known as a man of after God's own heart. And, you know, the, the heart in Scripture, we have to understand, is a, is a comprehensive term. Oftentimes it's not talking about the, the thing that's beating in our chest. Um, it's, it's talking about the comprehensive being of man. It's talking about who the authentic you, who you really are, uh, the whole of you. It's... It's the part of our being where we think and we deliberate and we decide. It's, it's the, the place of our spiritual activity. Um, there's, it's, it's, the, uh, it's where our feelings and our desires and our passions, our thoughts, it's the center, the core of our person. That's the heart. That's what God's getting for. And listen, God isn't looking for a place in your heart. God says, I want all your heart. In other words, God's not saying, I'm looking for a place in your life. Uh, if, your life if your life is a pie chart, God's not looking for a slice. Okay? God says, I'm the whole pie. Uh, I'm your life. That's, that's everything is me. Uh, it, don't, don't make God a, a slice. Make God the entire pie. That's what God's looking for. We call that wholehearted Christianity, where, where you're out and out for God. God has all of you. Where you're loving the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. Now, let's look at the characteristics of a wholehearted Christian. We see this in Psalm 26. So have your Bible open there. And here's some characteristics of what it means to be a wholehearted Christian. Number one, it means that we desire to be tested by God. That's a mouthful right there. All right, A lot of people don't want that, but if you're going to be out and out for God, you want God to test you. Look what he prays. Judge me, O God, or O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. David is penning these words, and he's, he's using some pretty serious uh, language here. Judge me. Telling God to examine me. He says, I want you to prove me. I want you to try me. Now, he's not saying that to someone else. He's saying that to God. He's really wanting God to be thorough with him. The wholehearted Christian does not concern himself with what other people say. He concerns himself with what God thinks and what God knows. That's what he's concerned about. And he wants God to be thorough. The only way to be free from the fear of man is to be searched out by God. Once God knows you, and you know that God knows you, you don't fear what man can do unto you. Daniel had no fear. The name Daniel, his name means God is my judge. He didn't fear what man would judge him. He didn't fear what man thought about him because he knew he would give account to God one day. And so, by the way, God desires to test us. 
In the New Testament, he calls it the proving of your faith, faith or the trial of your faith. Proving the trustworthiness of our faith. Did God test Abraham? Yes, he did. He tested him when he had him sacrifice his son, Isaac. And he didn't have to do that, but he wanted to see, are you willing to do that? And God was testing him. He said, now I know that thou lovest me. He tested, Jesus tested Philip at the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus said, uh, he could see disciples talking. There's 5,000 men besides women and children. And he says, give ye, some, give ye them to eat. And, and Philip says, well, Lord, uh, so many penny worth of bread, 200 penny worth, I think, of bread is not enough to feed these. In other words, Philip, the accountant, had already figured out just exactly how much would be needed to feed a crowd this size, even if we gave them a little bit. And Jesus said this, he said, the Bible said, Jesus said to prove him. Because he himself knew what he was going to do. But he wanted to see, I, I'm testing you, Philip. Will you guys come to me and say, Jesus, what do you want us to do? You ever been in those situations? And you wonder, and, and what do we do? We get out our paper and our pen and we say, okay, let me figure this out. What can I do? And I wonder if God is saying, I'm proving you. I'm testing you to see if you'll look to me to take care of your problem. If you'll look to me to satisfy the need. Or will you just try to figure it out on your own and then ask me to bless your plan? That's often what we do. And so God is saying, I'm testing you, I'm, I'm testing you and I want you want to try me. Look at, hold your finger there in Psalm 26. We'll come back to that. Turn over with me to Psalm 139. Would you look there with me, please? Psalm 139, again, a psalm penned by David. And again, he goes along the same, the same idea here of God asking God to search him. Notice Psalm 139, verse 23. What does David say? What's the first two words, church? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, test me, and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. There's a big difference between having God search you and you search you. There's a big, there's a big difference between God knowing your heart and you know in your heart. We know that our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know them? We can't know it. Can our heart deceive ourself? Yeah, we can. All, every day. Your heart will deceive yourself. You've heard me say this often. Uh, the, world, the world's mantra of follow your heart is one of the worst pieces of advice you can ever get. All right? Uh, the heart is deceitful and it'll, it'll, the only one who can know your heart is the one who made your heart, and that's God. God knows my heart. The, the Word of God, the Bible says, remember, is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, of the core of our being, where we do our thinking. And so he's saying, God, you search me. You know my heart. You try me. You test me. You know my thoughts. He says another place, he knows my thoughts are far off. God knows what you're thinking. Let me help you with something. The devil does not know what you think. Okay, the devil is not omniscient. That's why be careful of you thinking some negative thoughts. Don't verbalize them. Once you verbalize them and you say them out loud, then the devil does have ears. And he does hear what you say. And then he'll know how to launch his attack against you. So be careful. So he says, God, you search me and you know my heart. You try me. You test me. It's amazing, isn't it? He said the first step of being out and out for God is being willing to say, God, you search me. You try me. You examine me. I, I want you to make sure there's no wicked way in me. That's an amazing statement. All right, number two. Let's go back to Psalm 26. We're going to, we desire to be tested by God. Secondly, the wholehearted Christian has faith in God. Has faith in God. Verse number 1, Judge me, O Lord, I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slide. Faith in God. He said, I trust God. I depend upon God. I look to Him. Therefore, I won't slide. That's where the term backsliding comes from. Backsliding always comes due to a lack of trust. A lack of faith in God. 
Faith is you're taking God at His word. You're just taking God at His word and trusting Him. When, when the Israelites came up to Kadesh Barnea right outside the promised land, and they got I me, mean, they're right there. And God had told them, you can possess the land. They, they sent in the 12 spies, and they came back, and remember, uh, 10 of them said, no way, Jose. Well, basically, they, they said that for our Spanish friends, right? And uh, no way, Jose. And uh, they, they said, no, we can't take that. And, and two, Joshua and Caleb said, this is what God said is ours. Let's go, let's go take it. And, and they, they didn't trust God. They didn't exercise faith in God. And they doubted Him. And what happened to Israel for the next 40 years? There's so many people I meet. You know what their Christian life is like? Going in circles. These are the people who say, how boring the Christian life is. How dull the Christian life is. You know why? Because of lack of faith. A lack of trusting God. They don't trust Him, and so they're just going in circles. And they go nowhere. And they just, they, they wonder wilderness to, their, to the, those who were 20 and upward that wouldn't go in. Their carcasses died in the wilderness. And then God took the next generation in. And they went in by faith. So, yeah, exercise faith in God. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So you have to exercise faith. You're saved by faith, and as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. That's why the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. We're walking by faith. So, we have faith in God. Faith always has an object. Okay? And, and so you don't just say, somebody says, well, what are you counting on to get you to heaven? Oh, my faith. Well, your faith in what? Faith is your confidence, see? It's your confidence, your assurance. Well, what is your confidence in? You? See? Is it in your confidence for salvation better be in Jesus Christ? And your faith better be in the right object or you're not going to get where you think you're going. And so, faith always has an object. And our, a wholehearted Christian, the object of our faith is God Himself. It's God. Okay? So, he says, number one, I desire to be tested by God. Number two, I have faith in God. Number three, the wholehearted Christian walks in the Word of God. Notice verse number three. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes. I have walked in thy truth. In other words, the wholehearted Christian desires to live his life according to the Bible. According to the Bible. We don't live after our imaginations. We don't live after our own thoughts. We don't live the way we want them to live. Go ahead, Bill. We got it, got it all interrupted now. So, All right. Get everybody where they need to go. All right. So we, we, we walk in thy truth. In other words, I'm going to choose, listen, the wholehearted Christian chooses to live his life according to the will of God as, re as revealed in the Word of God. That's a conscious decision we make. That I no longer will live the rest of my time in the flesh to the will of the flesh, but to the will of God. I'm making a conscious decision that it'll not, it will no longer be what I want, what I think, and what I feel, but what God wants, what God thinks, and what God feels. That's a conscious decision I come to if I'm going to be a wholehearted follower of Jesus Christ. I, I, I think all of us can say we've talked the truth. I think all of us could probably say, if you've been saved any length of time, there are times you've balked at the truth. But I'd like to be able to say, I've walked the truth. And we ought to desire to say, I walk the truth. Any task we do as Christians should be done with wholehearted dedication. H.A. Ironside said he learned this early in life. He was working for a Christian shoemaker. Young Harry's job was to prepare the leather for the soles. He would cut a piece of cowhide to size, soak it in water, pound it with a flathead hammer until it was hard and dry. That was quite a wearisome process. 
and he wished it could be avoided. Harry said, I would often go to another shoe shop nearby to watch my employer's competitor. And he said, this old man didn't pound the leather after it came from the water. Instead, he immediately nailed it onto the shoe he was making. And Harry said, I went to him one day and I said, I noticed you put the soles on while they're still wet. Are they just as good as if they were pounded? And the owner of the shop said with a wink and a cynical smile, no, but they come back much quicker this way. Young Harry hurried back to his boss and suggested that perhaps they were wasting their time by drying out the leather so carefully. And upon hearing Harry say that, his employer took out his Bible and turned to Colossians 3 and verse 23. And he said, Harry, I do not make shoes just for the money. I'm doing it for the glory of God. If at the judgment seat of Christ I should have to view every shoe I've ever made, I don't want to hear the Lord say, Dan, you did a poor job. You didn't do your best. I want to hear the Lord smile, or see the Lord smile and hear Him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. He said it was a lesson that I learned in practical Christian ethics that I never forgot. Walking in the Word of God. I'm not the, the job you do where you work when you go to work tomorrow morning, you're not working for that employer, though you're working for them. You're ultimately working for God. The you, job you do, you do for His glory. The job you do, you do to honor Him. The job you do, you do because you want to please Him. David said in Psalm 119, I'll keep thy precepts with my whole heart. David said also later in Psalm 119 in verses 161 and 62, he said, My heart stands in awe of thy word, and I rejoice with thy word as one who finds a, a great spoil, spoil a great treasure. He said, I, I, do, do you rejoice in the word of God like it's a great treasure? Remember, do you remember when you first got saved? And you begin to read the Bible, and it was like, wow, wow. How amazing this is. Learning things for the first time. And seeing things for the very first time. So you, you desire to walk in God's Word. You don't, have to, you don't have to wonder what would Jesus do. You just have to know the Word of God and you'll know what God wants you to do. People are wondering, but they're wondering because they're ignorant of God's Word. My, a wholehearted Christian says, I'm walking according to the Bible. Alright? So a wholehearted Christian desires to be tested. We desire to have faith in God. We desire to walk in the Word of God. Number four, we desire to live a separated life. Notice what he says in verses four and five. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers, and will not sit with the wicked. Notice he says, I'm not sitting with the wicked. In verse 4, I've not sat with vain persons. You know, and I thought about this, is sitting is a choice. Sitting is a choice you make. When you sit down, you're at ease. When you sit down, you intend to stay. You ever had somebody stop by to see you or come to your home and you say, come on in, have a seat. And they say, no, 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 I can't stay. I've just, I've got to keep going. I just wanted to drop this off. Or I just wanted to tell you this. Or I just, sitting means I'm going to stay a while. Now the Bible says clearly we may have to do business with vain persons. We have to do business with wicked people. We may have to be a good neighbor to a vain person or a wicked person. You may have to work with a vain person or a wicked person, but it doesn't mean you have to sit with them. It doesn't mean you have to choose to spend time with them outside of what you must do. You cannot keep God's commandments and hang around people who don't keep God's commandments. The, the principle in RU we have is those who do not love the Lord will not help you serve the Lord. 
And you can't serve God and love God and hang around people who don't serve Him and don't love Him. It, it will affect you. And, and by the way, whether you sit with them physically or whether you sit in your easy chair and invite them in through your flat screen, it's the same thing as keeping company with them. It's just on. <laughs> Got awful quiet on me there. Evil communications corrupt good manners. I think there's, I think I saw somewhere today that there's some sort of awards program tonight. Is it Oscars? I don't care. <laughs> I. I won't sit with vain persons. I will not go in with dissemblers. That's hypocrites. I, I hate the congregation of evildoers. I won't sit with the wicked. Period. If you're not sure what that is, revert back to the previous point. I want to walk in the ways of the Word of God. And those who don't love God aren't going to help me serve God. And if somebody missed church tonight to stay home and watch the Oscars, pretty simple, you're not right with God. I hope I didn't, hope I didn't get too mamby-pamby about that. <laughs> love for Christ causes me to separate from those who do not love Christ. Pretty simple. When you, when you make your marriage vows... You make your vow that you'll, you'll pledge yourself to your, wedding, to your spouse, to your wife, to your husband, and forsaking all others. Is that because you hate everybody else? No. It's because you love the one you're marrying. Okay? And since I love them, I have to not be with the others. Do you love Jesus Christ? seems to always come back to the love question. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? That's what it boils down to. So you have to love the Lord your God with all your heart. A young woman in England many years ago always wore a golden locket that she wouldn't allow anyone to open or look into. Everybody thought there must be some romance connected with her locket. And... That locket inside, there must be a picture of someone who she loved. Well, the young woman died at an early age, and after her death, they opened the locket. Everyone was wondering whose face they'd find inside that locket. And when they finally opened the locket, all they found was a simple little slip of paper with these words written on it, Whom having not seen, I love. The Lord Jesus was the only lover she wanted and the only lover she longed for. That's, that's being willing to be separate from the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's not my words, that's the Word of God. And I know it's not a popular word these days, but it is the Bible. That's why, that's why we don't, in, listen, that's why we don't invite the world into the church. We don't bring the world's music in. We're not bringing the world's entertainment in. We're not conducting our church service like a, like a worldly rock concert. The, the church is a called out assembly. Called out from where? The world. And we come together, we're called out from the world and assembled. If we bring the world with us, we're not called out. We really cease the right to be called a church if we do that. A wholehearted Christian will be separate from the world and, and will desire to please the Lord Jesus. Desires to be tested. A wholehearted Christian has faith in God. A wholehearted Christian walks in the Word. A wholehearted Christian will live a separated life. A wholehearted Christian, number five, will pray to God. Number six, verse number six, I will wash mine hands in innocency, so will I compass thine altar, O Lord. Wash, wash my hands. He said, I'm going to clean my hands. 
clean hands are is a, is is innocency before God. It's clean being clean before God. I would submit to you that clean hands are praying hands. He talks about coming to the altar of God. When I'm clean with God, I can approach the altar. I can come into His presence. God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Those creatures before the throne of God, night and day, we say 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, there's no such thing in heaven, but continually they're saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And we think we can just have sin in our heart and in our life and enter into the presence of God. And God will hear us. Truth is, sin blocks my prayer to God. I need cleansing. I need to be clean when I come before God. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me, the Bible says. And I don't know about you, I need God to hear me. None of us can live the Christian life without God. You cannot live a victorious Christian life without God. You cannot do it. The Christian life is not hard. The Christian life is not difficult. The Christian life is impossible without God. It cannot be done. We spoke a little bit about prayerlessness on Wednesday night, and I won't belabor that point here. But you remember when Adam and Eve uh, walked in fellowship with God in the cool of the day and took the walks in the garden with God. But when they sinned and they disobeyed God, and they, did against, they went against God's command. When God came down to walk with them, what were they doing? Hiding from God. No desire to seek God. No desire to want to talk to Him. They wanted to stay away from Him. What does sin do in my life? What does sin do in your life? It causes you to want to hide from God. It causes you to want to stay away from His Word and stay away from prayer. And stay away from, from the people of God even. But it causes you to stay away from the Lord. So you, you have 1 John 1, nine. If you confess our sins, we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In being clean from sin, we approach God and we pray to Him. The wholehearted Christian, number six, witnesses for God. Lotus verse number seven. He's saying that I may publish with a voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. He says, I want to publish with a voice of thanksgiving and tell everybody of your wonderful works. He's saying, I won't be able to keep quiet. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be wonderful to be so full of God you can't keep it in? When, when it's amazing when we get excited about something how, how easy it is to go tell somebody about it. If there's a sale going on somewhere, man, it'll spread like wildfire. There's a, there's a, you know, a good deal at a restaurant, man, we'll tell everybody about it. But boy, I tell you, we have the best news that there's ever been, and the best news in the history of the world, and we're willing to keep quiet about it. My friend David said, I want to publish it, man. I want to, I want to with the voice of thanksgiving, I want to tell all of thy wonderful works. I like the, the song that says about, um, um, I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeemed. Redeemed. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Man, there ought to be something in it. said, man, I just can't keep quiet about it. I have to tell somebody about Jesus. Get so full of Him and spend so much time with Him, we have to tell them about Jesus Christ. When I've been tested by God and I have faith in God and I'm walking in the Word of God and I'm living a separated life unto God and I'm praying to God, well, I think I'll just be telling everybody about Him. It'll just seem natural. It'll just seem normal to want to do that. Let me ask you a question. Who have you told about Jesus lately? Since, since last Sunday night to this Sunday night, seven days, 168 hours, 
who have you told about Jesus? Who have, you, who have you even taken a track and handed it to and said, here's some of the best news you'll ever hear about in your whole life? Just, just give them the gospel if you can't say anything. But we ought, to, we ought to be telling others of Christ and publishing His works. Well, seventh characteristic of the one who's wholehearted is verse number eight. He loves the house of God. Notice what he says, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Notice verse number 12. My foot standeth in an even place. In the congregations will I bless the Lord. You know, David's saying, I think, I lo- he's saying, I love the place where God is. You know, I like to be where God is. I like, I like the house of God because God said whenever we gather together, there He'll be in the midst. This is, this is where I like to be. You know what? I like to be here because you're going to be the people I'll spend eternity with. You think about that? Look at verse 9. David says, Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, and whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. Gathering is death. And David is simply saying, Gathering time is death. And he's saying, Listen, God, I haven't spent time with those people here, and I'm sure glad I'm not going to spend eternity with them. That's exactly what he's saying. I rejoice that I love the people of God here. And you know what's great? I'll get to spend eternity with them. i got a hard time understanding people who say, yeah, yeah, I believe in Jesus and I'm saved, but I don't want to go to church. I don't have any use for church. I think, well, man, what? how are you going to get along with everybody in heaven? How are you going to get along with people in eternity? These are the folks you're going to be with forever. Don't you think you ought to get used to them now? Don't you think you ought to enjoy them now? This is the this is the foretaste of what heaven can be like. Wow. If you don't love the people of God here, how are you ever going to enjoy heaven? Wholehearted Christian loves the house of God. Desires to be tested as faith in God. Walks in the Word, lives a separated life, prays to God, witnesses for God, and loves the house of God. Now listen carefully. When you live this way, Christianity isn't something you do, it's something you are. Remember when Paul was, when Saul was persecuting the Christians, he went to find if there were any of this way. And, and because they looked at it, they knew it was a way of life. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life, He's not only the way to heaven, He's the way to live. And so we live this way. You know, the world doesn't quite, those who don't know Christ don't quite grasp that. They're okay with you being a Christian as long as you just leave it at church. Just leave it in here when you walk out the door. Don't bring it to work with you. Don't, don't let it influence your day-to-day decisions. But you understand that's impossible for a believer. Because Christianity is not something we do, it's what we are. We're Christians. And so when I live that way, out and out for God, and I'm out and out as a Christian, I'm wholehearted as a Christian, three things are going to happen. All right? I won't spend time on them, but I'll tell you, three things will happen. God will be glorified. And that's what we're here for. Whether we eat or drink, whatsoever we do, we're to do all to the glory of God. We're to, we've been bought with a price, therefore we glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are God's. God will be glorified. The second thing that happens, others will be edified. And we're supposed to be building others up. We're supposed to be uh, helping other people live for God. And you know the third thing is? You'll be satisfied you'll be satisfied. There's a great satisfaction that comes to the believer who wholeheartedly lives for God. The miserable person tonight is not necessarily the lost person. 
There is a pleasure in sin for a season. And the lost person who doesn't have the Holy Spirit in them and doesn't have their spirit, they're just soul and body, they can enjoy sin. The miserable person, the most miserable person tonight is the half-hearted Christian. The person who's trying to live with one foot for God and one foot in the world. Trying to please God, but I still want to please the world. I still want to do what God wants, but I want to do what I want. I want to do what God thinks, but I want to do what I think. And we back and forth. And an unstable, uh, the, the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Boy, you're not happy. You're miserable. You know who's satisfied? The ones who say, I'm just out and out for God. I'm in. 100% in. God has everything. Have you ever given Him everything? I'll, I promise you, God will be glorified. Others will be edified. And you will be satisfied. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth this evening. Lord, we desire to be wholehearted Christians. Thank you for David. Thank you for him being a man after your own heart. Thank you for this psalm that he penned to help us understand the characteristics of someone who is a wholehearted Christian. That's what I desire to be, Lord. I don't want to be halfway in this. From the very core of my being, I want to seek you with all my heart. And I believe there's numbers of others in this room who have that same passion and that same desire. Lord, help those who are wavering. Help those who maybe are half-hearted and they're willing to admit it. That by surrendering to you everything, by becoming a wholehearted Christian, they'll glorify you, they'll help others, and they will be satisfied. David said he'd be satisfied when he awoke in your likeness. And so, Lord, I pray you'll minister to each of our hearts now and help us to respond to what you're telling each of us to do. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and I'll finish praying in just a moment. But before I pray, let me ask you this. You'd say, Pastor, I really desire to be a wholehearted Christian. I don't want to be part in. I don't want to be most in. I want to be all in. That's what God has put in my heart, and I know that's what He wants, and that's what I want to be. And preacher, as you were speaking tonight, the Spirit of God pricked my heart. And I appreciate you praying for me this evening as I seek to do what God wants me to do. Will you slip your hand up, Christian, say pray for me tonight? Amen. 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 God bless you. That's good. You may put them down. In a moment, we'll pray. We'll have our invitation. It begins by you bowing the knee. Bowing the knee before God. Just surrender to Him. Don't, don't commit. Surrender. Say, Lord, have your own way in my life. And then set out to follow the steps of a wholehearted Christian as was outlined in Psalm 26. And God will bless your life beyond your wildest imagination. Father, have your will and way in this invitation now. Thank you for speaking to hearts. I ask you, Lord, that your will will be done now in each heart and life as they respond to what you've told them to do. Lord, I pray that each one would bow the knee that you've spoken to. No one would resist you tonight. But did walk out the doors tonight and say on March 4th, 2018, I surrender to be a wholehearted Christian. Lord, I'll thank you for what decisions are made for your glory tonight. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name.